Welcome. In this session, we're going to speak about the health status of people in different parts of the world. When you finish this session, you should be able to describe some of the progress made in improving human health in the last several decades, describe some of the key gaps that remain to improving human health, indicate some of the key indicators for measuring progress in global health, articulate how those indicators vary across countries and income groups. And finally, indicate the importance of highlighting differences in health status, not only across countries, but within countries as well. Let's begin by talking about some of the good news in global health, some of the important progress that's been made over the last several decades in improving human health globally. First, there's been an increase of 42% in life expectancy globally from 1960 to 2013. Never before have so many people lived for so long. Second, there's been a substantial reduction in under five deaths. 50% fewer under five deaths occurred in 2013, in fact, than in 1990. There are 1.2 million fewer new cases of HIV than there were in the mid to late 1990s as well. There are 500,000 fewer TB deaths per year in HIV negative individuals uh, than there were in 1990. There are almost, um, maternal deaths have been cut since 1990 by almost half. There's been a greater than 50% decrease in malaria mortality rates among under five children since the year 2000. More than 2.5 billion children have been immunized against polio since 1988, and polio is now down to only about 100 cases globally. And finally, there's been a 99.9% .9 reduction in the guinea worm since 1986, and there are now just a handful of guinea worm cases left in the world before the world can say that it's eradicated guinea worm disease. Now, despite this very good progress, there are also some really important areas where there's been much less progress, and there remains an important unfinished agenda in global health. There are still 6.3 million under five children who die every year in the world. And if you divide that by 365 days, that's about 17,000 under five children who die every single day in the world. Now about 45% of these deaths are related to the fact that these children are undernourished. They either don't get enough food or they don't get a diverse enough diet or they're lacking, for example, in certain micronutrients. These deaths would not occur if these children were better nourished. Despite the progress against HIV, there's still 1.5 million AIDS deaths in 2013. Despite the progress against HIV, there's still more than 2 million new HIV infections every year. Um, there's been substantial progress in reducing the burden of tuberculosis, uh, and yet there were still 1.5 million TB deaths in the world in 2013, almost 600,000 malaria deaths, almost 300,000 women who die of pregnancy-related causes, and about 2 billion people worldwide who are infected with soil transmitted helmets. So let's probe some of the good and some of the bad news by looking at some health status, by first defining some of the health status indicators that we're going to use in measuring health. And then what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll probe them and look at how those health status indicators play out for different regions of the world. Before I show you the definitions, let's ask the students about some of the important definitions of key global health indicators. Uh, Emily, if I might, what is the maternal mortality ratio? The maternal mortality ratio is the number of women who die from pregnancy-related causes for every 100,000 live births. And Elizabeth, what's the uh, neonatal mortality rate? The neonatal mortality rate is the number of neonates, or children under the age of 28 days, who are dying per 1,000 live births. Uh, and. Uh, Again, what's a neonate? Uh, an infant who's under 28 days old. And why would we pay particular attention to neonates, to infants who are under 28 days of age? Um, because a person is 
at the most dangerous stages of their lives at the very beginning of it and at the very end of it. So looking at neonates um, indicates the risk of death at a person's start of life. Okay, it's a really risky period. And Yafet, uh, what's an infant? An infant is uh, a child under one year. And what's the infant mortality rate? So that is the um, number of under uh, one year old infants who have died uh, per 100,000 uh, live births. Per 1,000 per 1, 1, per 1, born, sorry, right, sorry. right. I know that Emily confused you. <laughs> it's 100,000 yes, per, per 1, and, and why, by the way, Vivek, why do we measure uh, maternal deaths over 100,000 mm -hmm. and neonatal deaths and infant deaths and under five deaths which I'm not going to define because we don't have to, uh, over a thousand live births. Because maternal deaths are more rare, and so we use the 100,000 rather than the 1,000 for the others. Right. If we, if we used a thousand for maternal deaths, we'd have to use a figure that's a fraction. It would be really hard to follow. So we measure maternal deaths over 100,000 live births, and we measure neonatal, infant, and under five child deaths. And I think I, I, think I forgot life expectancy. Shailen, what's life expectancy? I should have started with that. Um, life expectancy is the, the age an infant is expected to live in a certain location um, given the trends um, that are in place when they are born uh, continue in the same way. Right. So these were all uh, well, well articulated definitions, but let's just reiterate them. Life expectancy at birth is the average number of years a newborn baby could expect to live if current mortality trends were to continue for the rest of the newborn's life. The maternal mortality ratio is the number of women who die as a result of pregnancy-related causes uh, for 100,000 live births in a given year. The neonatal mortality rate is the number of deaths to infants under 28 days of age in a given year per 1,000 live births in that year. Infant mortality rate parallels neonates. And under 5, child mortality rate is, is um, the probability that a newborn baby will die before reaching age five, expressed as a number per 1,000 live births. So now let's, now that we have a better sense of these health indicators, let's look at how these health indicators play out, as I mentioned, for the different uh, World Bank regions of the world. And for each of these, what we're going to do is look at them by World Bank region, uh, and we're going to uh, look at them as well for some of the high-income countries. So here we see changes in life expectancy at birth for World Bank region and high income countries over the period 1960 to 2013. Rachel, what messages should we take away from this graphic? That from 1960 to 2013, there has been a significant increase in life expectancy globally, but that there is still a huge gap between the life expectancy in high income countries and those in lower income regions, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. Right. Uh, Life expectancy has been increasing. It's been increasing in all regions of the world. And yet, despite these increases, there remains a substantial gap between the life expectancy in some regions of the world and some others, with the largest gaps concerning Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Let's look now at the maternal mortality ratio. And uh, Emily, let me come back to you uh, on this one. What are the most important takeaway messages from this graphic that shows maternal mortality ratios for World Bank regions and high-income countries uh, and globally as well for the year 2013. Well, we can see that there's a huge disparity between high-income countries and Sub-Saharan Africa really is suffering the most and South Asia is also not doing very well. Right, so what we see here, uh, as Emily has pointed out, is the maternal mortality ratio in Sub-Saharan Africa, in fact, is about 30 times the rate in the high-income countries. And this maternal mortality ratio in South Asia is more than 10 times the rate in the high-income countries. And just as an aside, remember, in principle, um, women die, in, in principle, anything above these rates is preventable. In the high-income countries, women rarely die of complications of pregnancy and maternal-related causes. In principle, I repeat, anything above this is preventable, and of course these are things we're going to talk about a lot as we make our way through the course. Let's look now at the neonatal mortality rate again for World Bank regions, high income countries, and globally. Vivek, what should we take from this slide? A similar trend here where 
South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa have significantly higher rates of neonatal mortality than a high-income country. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's more than seven times, and in South Asia, it's about eight times the rate of a high-income country. Right. So exactly as Vivek has said, what we see is a pattern not so different from the pattern that we saw for the maternal mortality ratio. We see uh, eight times the rate of, um, of neonatal mortality in neonates in South Asia, as in the high-income countries, seven and a half times here. And again, let me remind you that, in principle, deaths over this level that occurs in the high-income countries ought to be preventable. Let's move on now and look at the infant mortality rate for World Bank regions, high-income countries, and globally again. And let's ask Yafet what you would take away from this slide. Yes, so as has been mentioned previously, it follows a very similar trend in which high-income countries um, have significantly um, lower infant mortality rates than both Sub-Saharan Africa and Sub-Asia. Um, yeah. All right, and these countries are, of course, somewhere in, in between, with the rates in the Middle East and North Africa almost four times, the rates in Europe and Central Asia more than three times, uh, and these also more than three times, the rate um, of infant mortality in the high-income countries. Let's look at under five rates. And here it's not a surprise. What we're going to see is a pattern that's quite similar to the pattern that we saw in almost all of the other slides, but certainly the slides for neonatal mortality and infant mortality as well. So what I'd like to do before we move away from these slides on health indicators is look at uh, actually one of my favorite slides. And this is a slide that combines neonatal mortality infant mortality, and under five, child mortality. Elizabeth, what, what do you make of this slide? If you could pick only one or two messages from this slide, what should we take away from it? Well, we see that in most regions, you have a higher risk of dying if you're uh, under 28 days old, but that risk <coughs> gradually decreases as you reach one year of age and then five years of age. However, in places like South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, unfortunately, the risk appears to be about equal between each one of those ages. So what we see here is, in the high-income countries, young children rarely die. For every 1,000 who are born, uh, only six will die before their fifth birthday. But of the six who die, four will actually die in their first 28 days. The better off the country is, the larger the share of total under five deaths will occur in the neonatal period because those children aren't exposed to very many other risks. They're not so likely to die of diarrhea, malaria, HIV, and as we know, if they die, sadly, they'll die of uh, still maybe of congenital anomalies that play out later, of accidents and injuries, or um, perhaps, sadly, of, of cancer. By contrast, and let's look at the most extreme difference, when we look at Sub-Saharan Africa, as Elizabeth has said, what we see is a really different pattern. Here what we see is high rates of neonatal mortality, high rates of infant mortality, and high rates of under five child mortality. But we also see an almost equal risk of dying in each of those three periods. Between the birth and the first 28 days, about a third of all the under fives who die will, will die. Between, the end of their, between their first month and their first year, it's another third of the under fives who die who will succumb. And then between the end of their first year and their fifth year, there's another third still. In Sub-Saharan Africa, somewhat uniquely, but a little bit mirrored, as Elizabeth said, for South Asia, there's this pattern in which children who survive to be 28 days old still face substantial risk of dying between their first month and their first year, and those who survive to, be, to live till the end of their first year still might face additional substantial risks of dying between their first birthday and their fifth birthday as well. Now, uh, before ending this session, there's one other point that I really want to make, and it's been highlighted by a number of these graphics. I want to suggest that as we think about global health issues, we should be very careful about using averages. So let's think, for example, about Pakistan. 
And let's think about maternal mortality in Pakistan. The maternal mortality ratio in Pakistan is about 185. But I want to ask Vivek, what do you think is the risk that a well-off, well-educated woman in Karachi who has pretty good proximity to an outstanding hospital like the Aga Khan Hospital, University Hospital, for example, what do you think is the risk or the likelihood that this woman will die of a pregnancy-related cause compared to the risk that a woman in a relatively well-off country will die of a pregnancy-related cause? It's probably quite similar. Um, she probably faces a much lower risk of dying than some of her counterparts in other poor areas of Pakistan. So th this is a woman who is very unlikely to die a maternal death, just like most women in high-income countries, because she's well-educated, she cares for herself well, she has good family circumstances, uh, she's well-fed, she's gotten good antenatal care, she's got access to good uh, em uh, obstetric care and good emergency obstetric care as well. But if we have an, so it, if, if her likelihood is very small, and yet the risk in Pakistan of a maternal death uh, overall is 185 per 100,000, well then what, Rachel's going on with a lot of other women in Pakistan, for example? That would suggest that a larger portion of the women who die of pregnancy-related causes in Pakistan are lower-income women because their rates of maternal mortality are even higher than the average. Right. Today. If the average is 185, and the better off people, even though they may not constitute more than 10% or something of the population, have very low rates, then th these worse off uh, economic, people who are worse off economically, they, their families must see women dying at much higher rates. And in fact, if you look at um, places like Baluchistan or Northwest Frontier Province, there are places in which the maternal mortality ratio in Pakistan probably goes up to something like 700 or 800 per 100,000 live births. So the point I want to make here again is uh, we have to use averages and some of the time using them will make very good sense and help us in our understanding. But we also need to be really careful about when we use them. And we must also remember to keep in mind not only differences across countries and across regions, but also differences within regions uh, and within countries as well. Hopefully by now you have a better understanding than you had earlier of key health indicators, um, some important progress in improving global health, some important parts of the unfinished agenda in global health. You also know that there are two regions in particular, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, whose health indicators lag uh, much of the rest of the world. You've seen how some of these health indicators play out for life expectancy, maternal mortality, infant mortality, neonatal mortality, excuse me, infant mortality and under five child mortality. And you also have an understanding of when it's useful to use averages and when one needs to focus in particular on not only the differences across countries, but also the differences within countries as well. In the next session, in the next session we're going to speak about the links between demography and health.